Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Bruno Talks with. Today we will be talking about building in public, the good parts, the bad parts, pros and cons, why it's so popular recently. Uh, it's kind of, a, let's say, a movement or even philosophy when it comes to product creation. Luckily for you, today I have a guest who recently went through all of this process and uh, his name is Danny Postman and uh, he is uh, willing to share his experience and his points of views on this topic. So, hi Danny, how are you? Thanks for being my guest. Welcome to the show. What are you doing? And uh, yeah, just some short introduction for those who don't know who you are. Hi Bruno, thank you for having me on the podcast. It's actually my first ever podcast, so pretty exciting to be here and thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Danny Posma, um, probably mostly known for two projects of mine, Lendingfolio.com and Headline.io. Um, started working in the open actually not that long ago. I think I started it, doing it in February this year after teaching myself to program, so I'm pretty new to it. I think I've seen the good parts of it, the bad parts of it, so I think it's going to be an interesting talk today with you. And uh, so you, uh, if I understood it correctly, so you recently started with uh, building in product, but uh, uh, what about your uh, programming skills before? Uh, did you even recently learn to it or are you longer doing uh, development? So I used to be a designer until uh, the age of 20, I think. At that time, I got an internship opportunity where they trained me to be a conversion specialist. So I went more to the, the marketing part of the world, actually. Conversion specialist is mostly you optimize websites, you do A-B testing, uh, a lot of psychology marketing. So I did that until I think like one year ago. I still do it for clients, mostly. But one year ago, I pretty much got pretty bored of the whole marketing world. Um, conversion optimization, you mostly, mostly make A-B tests, you test something, they throw it away, you optimize it, blah, blah, blah. So one year, I think it was last year, November, I decided to start learning to program. I knew HTML and CSS, but I think all the haters say that's not programming, so let's keep it that way. So last year, November, I started to learn uh, Vue.js, uh, backend development, all the things. Pretty much did it in incognito until February. I spent six months learning it, redeveloping Landing Folio, and launched it. And during that time, I felt comfortable enough to start sharing in the open what I was building and stuff like that. So yeah, it's a pretty recent start in my programming adventure, pretty recent start in working in the open. Well, uh, one could say that you also have some kind of uh, advantage here because when you are starting, uh, uh, usually when developers starting with their side projects, they are pure developers and uh, uh, li like myself. So I also did, did something. And uh, so <clears throat> you have some experience, uh, some background in marketing, uh, as you also mentioned, uh, some background in even some kind of uh, psychology. Maybe it's kind of uh, yep. consumer psych psychology and uh, th things like that. So th those are definitely, I would say, Say, um, uh, maybe even reasons uh, why, why you have some uh, successful uh, products after all and uh, okay uh, to start uh, maybe um, I mean we are seeing this uh, building in public we are seeing this building in public hashtags and uh, everyone is talking about that but uh, when, when for those who, who uh, didn't even encounter it before maybe what's your what's your definition of uh, building in public what's uh, some some short, short shorter description uh, uh, what's what's building in public. I think in like there's for me there's two ways of uh, building in the public. I think way number one is sharing it mostly on Twitter and on indie hackers. Um, what I do mostly is I, I tweet about my progress, what I've learned, what I've built, um, and it's a really good way to get a feedback of people uh, online. And the, on the other side, I think working in, in the open here in Changu, in my co-working space, Tropical Nomad, we have, uh, we have this group, Hackagu. I think you already talked with it uh, about with Andrew. And every Tuesday, Thursday, we come together um, at 10 o'clock. We pitch, hey, we're gonna, I gonna, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to work, work on this. And at 4 p.m., we get five minutes to show what we're working on. People give feedback to you. What do they not understand? What could be better? And that way... Um, yeah, we're basically just sharing our progress and it's a really good way to get feedback and learn from other people. And that's also how I learned to program all those people helped me while I was building here. I had questions about how do I stitch it back in together, um, all those things. So yeah, it's uh, yeah, partly sharing what you do uh, online and maybe offline. 
And uh, the the moment when I mm, spotted you first, let's say that way, uh, was with this uh, headline uh, yep. product. Uh, I know that that you're also building a landing landing folio. Uh, I'm not really sure what what comes first, but. Uh, I planned to focus this episode ar- around uh, the experience what you have uh, w- w- with the uh, headline, and yep. uh, so the the very beginning uh, was uh, I mean my uh, introduction to to, to w- what you are doing is this uh, post on indie hackers. Uh, I mean I know what you were doing even before, but this was a kind of a bigger let's say milestone where where you shared uh, how you yeah. earned uh, like uh, I remember if I remember correctly something like 16k in 48 hours uh, the post uh, and uh, you provided pretty much pretty much a lot of details uh, there so probably uh, too much I, I was yeah maybe maybe even too much yeah we will be talking <laughs> about that la- later uh, so but. Uh, that post that that post on indie hacker uh, got pretty much attention and it was it was pretty much remarkable uh, i uh, don't remember i mean on indie hackers that uh, some post gets so, so much upvotes i mean every now and then we have th- those kind of posts but uh, th- this got pretty much uh, high numbers uh, i mean in upvotes and comments and uh, and uh, and uh, everything but uh, it seems that people like uh, transparency. Yep. So, and you were pretty much transparent uh, about that. Maybe uh, would you like uh, t- to uh, to share with share with us and share with me uh, in that moment when you were writing uh, that blog post? What was your uh, feelings? Uh, what was your expectations? What would you what what did you expect uh, to get out of that uh, blog post? But from that perspective, uh, from that day when, when you wrote it, when you, when you posted it? That's a really good question, what I wanted to get out of it. I think it was like one way of uh, celebrating my victory, what I did, because it was completely, I was completely blown away what revenue I did with it. It was completely crazy. Um, so partly for me, it was like um, writing down what I did, uh, what I did. So I can capture it for a later launch, for example. I'm keeping notes in a tool called MindWave. Uh, where every day I update what I did well in the launch, what I did well with development or whatever. And on the other side, I really wanted to share uh, my learnings from what I did well, because I wanted to help out the Indie Hacker community, obviously. Um, What I've realized is I think I'm in like um, a good position with my marketing background. And I feel like Indie Hackers need a lot of help with how to write a compelling landing page, how you can use pricing tactics, and I think that with my launch of Headline, I utilized a lot of good things on the landing page and with the with the launch, especially the, the lifetime deals, which was a big aspect of all the sales. And after the post, I saw a lot of other people trying lifetime deals. I got a lot of DMs, people saying, hey, I did more revenue in six months than uh, in more revenue in two days than I did in six months. So I think it really restored people. So yeah, it was mostly trying to help out this community. I think that we are in, a special kind of era and a special industry where everyone is sharing so much with each other. You can learn so much with each other because I learned most of my things by lurking on indie hackers for two years before I, I kind of joined myself. So I wanted to give back to the community in that way. And uh, yeah, uh, as you mentioned, uh, maybe maybe you even shared uh, <laughs> even more more than you should. But uh, yeah, okay. And uh, were you aiming uh, for uh, lifetime deals uh, in the beginning, or were you aiming for? Uh, um, I, I'm switching back to the headline product. So mm-hmm. uh, at the moment uh, of la- launching, uh, I mean, you just mentioned it, mentioned uh, it. So I want to to continue on that. So. Uh, what what's your uh, what was your goals to to have more like uh, lifetime deals or to have some kind of monthly or i don't know yearly subscription i think in the long term monthly subscriptions are the most important but i realized two things i think i, I test drive the, the the lifetime deals with another product i launched that didn't do that well it was like a month before headline in spireframe.io and what i realized is i have the feeling that a lot of people are subscription fatigued like adding another tool to your to your inbox or to your to your subscription list, like people don't want that. The tool was pretty much MVP, so I also thought that it wasn't worth to pay for the MMR. But on the other side, uh, with the lifetime deal, I could 
sell like get the money up front um if the the the, the monthly subscription price was nine dollars the lifetime deal eventually price was 129 dollars so that means that normal users i think the the percentage of people that churn before a year is pretty high right so if you can capitalize on getting that money already in the first like in the first time um it is a really good runway for you to utilize uh, furthermore, for example, now I did really well with the launch. I will not go into too much of the numbers after uh, after the Idiaka post, but I'm using all that money to reinvest. I've hired a copywriter that's writing part time all the new copy updates for me, um, using the money to invest in other places and tooling and stuff like that. So I think it gives like a really good runway. It feels like it feels like like a small angel investment for my customers um, in that way that I have a year now of money to work on this project and I don't need to do much of freelancing with that. So um, I think that's the, the the positive side of doing lifetime deals. And furthermore, I realized there's a lot of lifetime deal communities surrounding AppSumo on Facebook. And these people are really, 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 really good early customers because they keep on sharing it. Like this group, there's a few people in there, they shared with their whole industry. So based on that, they did free marketing for me. I got a lot of sales that way. Uh, I got a lot of early customers. They gave me a lot of feedback, uh, what I should add to the tool. Basically, I wanted to just do the headlines and eventually out of all the feedback to say, hey, you should add Facebook advertising, you should emails and stuff like that. So I think it's a really good way to get your early adopters, get your first startup funding and um, yeah, get some comfortable money in your bank so you can work on your project and then later on focus on MMR, MMRR, MR, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, for, for those who don't uh, know or maybe who are curious uh, also, I mean, for, for indie hackers that are in dilemma, uh, would, you, would they go with uh, subscription or lifetime deals? Uh, maybe ca can you share uh, what's your or maybe is there even a standardized formula how to calculate a lifetime deal price? So what, what was uh, the baseline in your, in, in your case? Uh, how, how did you approach it? How, I mean, how did you get that price? So I know platforms like AppSumo and Stack, Stack Social, they, they want you to price it between $49 and $99. I think that's pretty, especially the $49 is completely outrageous to give someone access for $49 for a whole life to your tool. Um, I kind of did it in this way that I set tiers. So, and I think this is one of the most successful parts of it. Uh, the first price was $49 a month. I added a counter that it was limited to 200 deals. And the day of the, the, it was completely insane. I put it on Product Hunt. It went pretty viral in other places. And the first lifetime deal, the first 200 spots sold out in 12 hours. So I had to, I think it was 3 a.m. here in Bali. I had to add a new pricing option, change the pricing page. Um, and after that, so I doubled the price. I added 200 new deals for $89. These deals ran out in uh, two weeks in total. And after that, I added a new one for $129. Um, so yeah, it's a really nice tier based pricing. I think it's a really good way also to validate what is the price people want to pay for your tool. I mean, $49, it sold out in 12 hours, 200 copies. Apparently that's way too cheap for the tool. So I was like, all right, I'll just try to double the price. And that sold out in two weeks again. So uh, I don't think there's any set rule to it. I think you just need to try it out, play with it, uh, try to see how you sell. For example, I could upgrade the price to $199 for the lifetime deal if I still offer the lifetime deal. And if no one bought it, I knew that was too much. So the value is between $129 and $199. Uh, but since now I've stopped selling the lifetime deals because I want to focus on the yeah the monthly, monthly subscription of it. Yeah, I'm also a big fan of this theory that uh, you start with uh, with some cheap uh, prices and then you even double it uh, or uh, raising it uh, uh, after some time. Uh, some pe some people are thinking like, uh, okay, but uh, what will I do with? Uh, I mean, how to treat those early customers? I mean, they are still on the, that uh, cheap price, and uh, for me, it's kind of like. Uh, these are your first customers you should appreciate them because they are actually first uh, 
first people yeah. that actually paid you money so it's kind of a compensation okay it's uh, don't, don't raise price on them so it's uh, keep it as it, as it is because uh, they, they were first there to support you and uh, to actually uh, give you money which is kind of the end uh, the, the actual validation and it's the end of the 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 foundation of, of the business it's, itself uh, you were saying that uh, uh, those communities also g gave you uh, a lot of uh, feedback uh, uh, about the, the product itself. Have you uh, ever pivoted uh, from the original idea or uh, um, did they have any impact um, on, the, on the product development itself? So uh, did you get, uh, maybe to rephrase the question, so uh, w when you, uh, did it affect the original uh, product that you had in mind? Uh, when you actually started the building it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I like I said, I just, the, the product started because me and a friend, we wrote a book with all these headlines four years ago. And a few months ago, I sat down uh, after um, working too long on Linux folio. I was like, what else can I make? And I just made a list of things I wanted to launch. And the initial idea was just make a tool where they can edit the headlines. Um, but based on the community feedback, um, I have one rule. If three people ask me for a feature, I build it. If one person asks you for a feature, it's it's like a small chance that they will even use it or they will ask a refund or whatever. But if three people use it, it's a pretty, uh, pretty much guarantee that it's needed by the community. So in these Facebook groups and via email, a lot of people gave feedback to the products, what you should add. And the first things were like, okay, you should add emails or different kind of contents. This is like a super good way for copywriters to quickly make their tools. And they send like examples of other products of how they used it. So based on that, I added feedback. Um, I've got them some other feature requests, um, like make a connection with Sapir and stuff like that. Um, those have been requested a few times now since this week, so I'm putting it on the on the backlist again. So yeah, mostly I think 90% of my features are defined by my customers. Um, I also tend to send an email out to my customers asking them, hey, I've got this ID, do you think this is useful? Or um, hey, what content would you like to see? And lots of engagement, a lot of people reply to me, oh, I would like to see email templates of live chat or whatever. So based on those replies, and if it's higher than three requests, I will build it into it. Yeah, that's pretty much uh, straightforward and simple, simple rules. So if you have like three people asking for it, go, go yep. build it. But uh, yeah, also definitely uh, whenever, um, from my from my point of view, uh, it's pretty much uh, important also to understand why people are, for example, asking for for something, because uh, sometimes uh, it can uh, happen that they want uh, one thing, but they are actually uh, requesting some something different because in their mind it's something that can be done like this. Big, and uh, on the other hand, you are a product uh, maker and you have a better overview, so maybe maybe you can give a. Uh, uh, I don't know, faster or better experience with uh, with, with some, something uh, different, still to achieve the, the same goal. That's that's why it's pretty much uh, important to understand why some someone is asking uh, uh, for, for some feature. That, that's also I realized this. Um, a customer asked me for a feature, like they wanted to add their own variables and snip like their own variable tags to the tool. So I built it in, and then uh, two days later, she asked for a refund because it didn't do what she wanted. So I asked her, like, what, why, like, what do you switch to? What are you using right now? Why did you, why did I add this feature? You didn't like it. You use another tool, and she gave an example of another tool she was using. And basically, because I didn't ask to like ask well enough through, I realized that that tool was exactly giving her what she wanted with the variables. So if I would have asked her a little bit more information regarding this feature request, I would have probably added the right feature to it and she didn't switch, switch away. So yeah, what you say is customers say one thing, they probably mean something else. So try to elaborate on it, try to learn what they really, really want. Ask for examples for it. Yeah, and uh, customers are also using, uh, as you said, another project uh, products, uh, maybe even switching to another product, but uh, they are uh, usually coming from uh, some well-established products. So, for example, uh, you can, you have Microsoft Excel and uh, people are uh, get used to what they can uh, do uh, in that uh, product and they are trying to i don't know make you reproduce the same uh, flow or same uh, same functionality and usually people are like like in your case variables and uh, 
can you can you just build this i i, I will know what what i will do do with that J just build me this and uh, uh, so without the proper understanding why the customer uh wants uh, wants the feature uh, you may uh, even miss the customer like in your case uh, like you said uh, she switched uh, to another product i'm i mean uh, it's one customer it's not a really big deal but uh, also if you if you understand the the potential of that feature so some features has has a real potential that can uh, shape the product a little bit uh, it's uh, pretty much uh, important to do, to understand the reason why some customers are uh, willing to have it in your product that in that way you can attract many many more customers uh, based on that and on that uh, features that's uh, that's also a thing when a customer also approach you with some uh, let's say custom feature that are specific for them uh, i mean that's that's my that's my uh, how, how i see it uh, because maybe you th you can think in the beginning uh, it's maybe for their company but uh, maybe in the maybe you can see the template from in their industry and then go to another company and say like you won't say like okay com company a is doing this this way but if you understand the reason and the, the motivation behind it maybe it can help you to, to develop a feature that can help a lot of companies in in the in the say in the same uh, industry okay um I wanted to, uh, yeah, we were talking about all those high numbers and everything and, uh, but uh, what's your uh, opinion why the headline is so popular, why the headline is so, uh, why there is a high demand uh, for a headline? I mean, m maybe, maybe also, sorry, uh, maybe also to, to, to explain a little bit uh, what the product uh, offers uh, for, for those who never heard of, uh, but uh, yeah, but but the main question is, uh, what, why, why do you think it's so? so um, I'll explain it quickly. Headline used to be a tool where there is, where there were headline examples, the uh, and there were variables into the headline, so you could easily, for example, um, change certain words to make the headlines or the other content fit for your need. Um, I think it was popular probably because of two um, two options there's a lot of people that want swipe, swipe files they uh, like marketeers they always want to speed up their marketing creation games when they write headlines for for their email clients for their landing pages whatever they always try to find for inspiration um, and i think my tool bundled all those things together and i think the most important part part of it is it saves them money instead of it uh, it charges them money like the tool costs, well, the first deal, let's let's get the middle ground. It's $89. It's a collection of, it's now 1,000 templates. So, uh, for example, there's like thank you email templates. There is um, live, uh, there's survey questions where you can just add your company name in and it generates survey questions for you. Um, based on that and based on the salary of an average marketer, if they use this tool and it saves them already one hour of their working time, they already earned it back. And I think this tool can save them during their lifetime so many hours that it's a no brainer for them to purchase a tool like this because it just makes their life easier. It makes their company life easier. It speeds up their workflow. Um, so I guess that was one of the, um, yeah, one of the reasons why it was a success. I think the other reason was probably the fact that what I already said is the scarcity I implemented. So there were 200 deals. If it runs out, you never see the price again. So normally, like what I learned, like this is a big part of what I did with my marketing job before. It's based on all, uh, I don't know if I pronounce it right, Cialdini, Cialdini's uh, book, Influence. It's uh, about how you can use social triggers, scarcity, and all the other things that kind of influence uh, people um in making a buyer process and what the scarcity does is a lot of people find your product on product hunt on on facebook on, on twitter they see it they think oh it's pretty nice but if there's not a urgency to buy it they're like oh i might i might buy it tomorrow when i get my credit card or whatever so tomorrow they forgot about it 100 percent sure so the moment that they see okay there's only 100 100 left for example of this deal they're like do i want this yes if i'm gonna come back tomorrow it's gonna be gone yes okay i will buy it um and I didn't have, like normally you would expect that if you use this and the tool is not that good, you would get a lot of refunds. And I think out of the seven, the 700 sales I got, well, I just called the number, so nice. Um, 
I got about 10 till 15 refunds. So I think the product provides value to them. Um, and number three is I do a lot and a lot of updates in a really quick speed. I, I tend to update the product twice a week with adding new templates, new categories, new features they request. So mostly in the Facebook group, everyone is supporting me because they say, then he just launches features every week. Like you has something, he builds it for you. Everyone is raving about it. He's open about it. So I think those three things, psychology things, um, it solves a problem. It saves the money. And number three is uh, open and quick development and listening to your customers. Yeah, and uh, and that that uh, second second point where where you are uh, building something that can save someone uh, money or time or a- any resource. That's uh, also, I think it's a kind of a recipe for a success. So, uh, it doesn't have to be a big success, but uh, if uh, people are uh, saving something w- with your product, I mean, be it like time, money or any other resource, there's a, a higher probability that uh, that they will actually use it and uh, buy it in, in the end. And also about that scarcity, uh, I remember that there was also uh, real real time bar of that uh, how many uh, products uh, i mean how many deals uh, were left uh, about the scarcity uh, um, yeah i kind of uh, hate that uh, psychology t- trick uh, because uh, because uh, but uh, uh, with one condition i I, w- I wanted to say something so scarcity is okay if you have some kind of a strategy so you are like uh, doubling the price or Th- things like that but uh, what what i hate uh, is like uh, okay you are lowering the price and say like uh, okay this won't be ever the case in your lifetime then you are uh, increasing the uh, the price and then again after like six months that you are again lowering and this this is uh, th- that i don't like and that also uh, shed some i don't know bad bad light not bad light but uh, um, some some bad thoughts uh, on that scarcity but in general uh, i'm okay with it, with it uh, until it's uh, like a real uh, real thing so okay now it's 49 dollars tomorrow is 69 dollars i don't know but if you don't go back to, uh, to again because it's not not really honest even it's then the whole purpose is just to uh, use the psychology trick and i, I don't like it yeah, no, 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 no. I think you should never, never, ever do that to your customers because one, they will never trust you again. Two, you have customers that pay more. You trick them basically to pay more and then it goes back to a normal price. Um, so yeah, if you use it, use it for real. Don't mess with uh, don't mess with those tactics. Uh, don't fake it like uh, booking.com with the last rooms because eventually people look at it and they're like, nah, this, this, is, this is mean, this is not good. Yeah, and in the end, uh, as you provide the example, in the end, you don't even trust anymore so the price uh, you, you just your brain is now trained to ignore those uh, warnings like uh, okay these pop-ups and uh, book your last room so you just ignore it because you know it will be uh, there and uh, there there were even examples where people just looked at the source code on some pages and where they randomly uh, returned some numbers of how many days left or how many products left and those things are kind of uh, bad uh, bad uh, patterns and uh, it's it's they, they are not good so don't don't do them if, if you are listening and if you are doing this please stop <laughs> <laughs> be real don't yes. fake it so you re- uh, you just uh, mentioned a number and uh, i want this is kind of um, introduction uh, to, to my next uh, question or topic so and i will also uh, it's kind of also related to the in the beginning where we mentioned this in the hacker post so i i saw that you took it down yep yep and why <laughs> i mean kind of obviously I, but i want to hear uh from from your you want to hear the whole the whole copycat drama story well, yes it's kind uh, of introduction for with a copycat a drama story and now now we are uh, going into the <laughs> to the dark side of, of this so may, maybe we can start with uh with the thing with the, with the fact that you actually took down the the indie hacker posts yep um 
working in the open has net positively been uh, has been net positive totally for me i grew my twitter from 500 to almost 5000 followers i think i got most of my sales via working in the open probably a lot via the in the hacker posts a lot via posting all my updates um, but the reason i took the post down is that over the last two months now i think headline has been and this is this is what i want to like um uh, want to elaborate i always say it got copied but it didn't get copied it got pl plagiarized it got stolen 10 times people took my whole landing page just copy pasted it they took all the content in my tools all the headlines i wrote for months all the emails everything all the content they copy pasted it they basically just recreate no they didn't even recreate it they just copy pasted the whole tool and then sold it for half the price and this has happened 10 times um there's a lot of people that pretended that they made a tool they went into all the marketing channels where i posted it saying hey uh, i made this tool uh, for half the price why don't you buy my tool instead of headline um, one guy one clone which was like literally a one-on-one -on -one copy he launched it on stack uh, social before i wanted to go on there so i lost that partnership another one copied i just translated all my headlines and all my emails to brazilian and i just put it out the guy copied it the next day and launched it in the brazilian growth uh growth hacking facebook group so it's been an absolute mess and a lot of like headache i've now realized that it's gonna happen i'm uh not gonna do anything about it anymore but it's been bothering me for it has been bothering me for one and a half months i like really got like I got sad. I got really angry about it because I, I worked so many hours, middle of the night, whatever, to get this product out and people just steal it from you, pretend it's you. Um, so yeah, I took down the hacker, uh, the indie hacker post. I think I was a bit too specific in how much money I earned with it. My problem with my tool is it is easy to copy because my product is based on copy and copy can be copy paste. <laughs> I don't think the 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 value of the tool wasn't in how i developed it and honestly i built it in a month the code on the needs is pretty simple uh, time is in all writing all the content and you can just copy paste that Control c Control v done just uh, just copy the landing page because i use tailwind it's really easy to copy so people just did that and they just launched it so i think getting back to it if your product is easily copyable be careful about working in the open and especially showing the numbers you earned with it because you will attract a lot of people and maybe they don't have bad intentions i i wrote another post about being copied i got really bad feedback on that they said ah oh, you should be uh, it should be it's a compliment like why are you so angry about it and then some comments were like hey i'm your future competitor um i'm not gonna clone you but i'm gonna do uh, emails and landing pages too and i was like that's what i did i have the feeling sometimes people get inspired and then they forget where they see it, but actually they got, they get so inspired that by accident maybe, or like subconsciously they recreate it or they think they made it. Um, so yeah, it was a pretty messed up time. I decided to take down the Indie Hacker post because I have the feeling that was the one that attracted too many copies. Um, I'm taking a Twitter break for a month or two to rebuild the whole tool and make it uncopyable, have it uh, being more unique this time. So, um, yeah, I think that's the backside of uh, working in the open. But I mean, if you if you bake a tool, for example, like Rome Research or Notion or whatever, like working in the open works pretty well because it's so tech savvy that no one is going to copy it. I mean, no one, not everyone. It's harder to copy. So you could be more open about it. But if your content is about copy, inspiration, something that's easily done, if you copy other people content and just copy paste it then maybe be a little bit more careful yeah and uh, also in in your case uh, i would say they copied the execution part not not actually the the idea i mean uh, uh, the idea was uh, i mean uh, many people uh, probably had the similar idea and like okay why wouldn't i put some templates but uh, when you actually provide uh, a lot of proofs that the idea is uh, actually working and that you provide the validation part, uh, I think that uh, what attracted uh, people uh, the most so that get, uh, as you said, inspired. And uh, I, rem I think I even uh, saw somewhere that uh, some someone even copied the, the your names or something like that. So copyright uh, in the bottom. So 
that's kind of too much inspiring <laughs> uh, uh, for, from uh, from someone but yeah uh, in the end it uh, it gets down to the, to copying the 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 execution part and uh, especially so for example if you are uh, sharing a uh, I don't know people people are sharing uh, for example churn rates or things like that mm -hmm. and for, for me that's that's also okay to share but uh, if you are sharing uh, for example things that make impacted uh, on that churn rates then it's kind of uh, I mean then you are sharing your knowledge uh, what what you gained when and what you uh, I mean uh, it's uh, it's all about learning so when you are building your product you are learning so what works well for the customer what doesn't work well and uh, if you for example come to the uh, I don't know solution that uh, that you realize it can really attract more uh, customers or more people more people who are willing to buy then uh, those kind of things uh, should be kept private but the whole number uh, the, the output number like okay now we have churn rate down to five percent or something like that i don't know i'm making up numbers for me that's okay because you are still open you are saying that you have amount specific amount of uh, churn rate but uh, things like what led to that number should be uh, kept private uh, at least uh, from my from my uh, perspective so you said you had like uh, 10 copycats or 10 10 products that and you also said that uh, you spotted them on some uh, same marketing channels where you plan or where, where you already uh, market market your uh, product uh, what was uh, how did you spot the first one was it also there on those existing marketing channels or uh, uh, the, the the very first one when when you spotted uh where did you spot it most are found by my customers so in this facebook group this lifetime group, groups people are posting hey denny uh what the hell is this the problem so how it started is the first one that i found it was literally a carbon theft copy steal for my product the same copy on the landing page the same videos the same content everything it was it was literally the same thing absolutely nuts so i got blamed by my customers i got uh they told me like why did i invest in your tool did you just buy this from code canyon like it, is anyone is everyone selling this you did this is just fake did you find it on a github repository and you're just trying to earn money with it it is it has been a i've been i've successfully defend myself and every everyone all the customers are fine with it but it's been a hectic like especially the first one it's been a hectic week i had to spend all my evenings trying to defend myself that I actually came up with this. I wrote the headlines together with my friends. I built a team, I built a tool. It's not a code. Um, so yeah, that's why I was taking it so personal because it is it is not a compliment. It's like, it, it can be really bad for your name as people think that you just stole it from someone else and people are gonna think you are the copy of someone else instead of so it's like, it felt like an insult to me. Like I spent so many hours developing a tool, building it out. It was like my first successful SaaS. I was so happy. And then like this whole happiness went like skyrocket into the ground. Uh, it's like someone stole your baby and then everyone around you tells you, yeah, but it's not your baby. It's like, she, it's, it's her baby. Uh, what are you talking about? So yeah, um, so that's how I found out customers. Uh, and then it kept on happening, it kept on happening. And eventually customers realized looking at the domain names when did it when did they sign up when did they buy it that i was the first one to make it and that's what i also want to set like there's a lot of tools after that that also do the same but they came up with their own copy their own landing page their own tool designs everything themselves like, i'm totally fine with it that's like competition that fuels me to make a better tool that makes me to add more content but if you steal something from someone it has such a huge impact on your business um so yeah and uh, I remember there, there were also, um, yeah, maybe, maybe just uh, to 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 uh, go back a little bit for, uh, back. So you said your your customer, uh, your your customer reported it and uh, said like, uh, why I'm even paying for you? And uh, I know I remember uh, I tracked your progress on on Twitter. So when you actually uh, release the first version and then add this or add that and change this change that but your uh, final customer doesn't see this or they they don't even interested in in, in that parts but it's uh, really uh, it's uh, very likely that uh, you you can uh, 
mis be misunderstood with all of those uh, people that are doing the same in the in the same loop uh, and uh, this is a uh, very uh, dangerous as, as you said because uh, your customer then can uh, suppose that uh, you all as well just renting your tool from somebody else and uh, yep. I don't know may maybe there is now even version zero of, of that of that tool uh, which they are uh, not not being uh, um, aware of and uh, I also yep. saw that uh, there were some uh, you also uh, did you t take some legal actions or in some cases or was it es escalated to the legal uh, actions uh, or was it just uh, precautious uh, measures? So we got the DMCA, which is the Digital Millennial Copyright Act. And basically it's a worldwide, I think all the big, most of the major companies agree by it. It's that copyrights, copyrighted content, uh, if you steal it, they have to take down the, the theft of it. So let's say um, one of this example, they just copied, I guess they copied my lend the whole product, right? You can go to, like, you can Google DMCA or abuse uh, Amazon. Um, and you can send them a form where you can say, hey, this is my website. This is being copied on this URL. Provide examples. Um, it's really easy to do that. You can go to buildwith.com. Build, build, buildwith.com. Yeah, you find what tech stack they are using. Um, then, for example, it shows, like, the domain is hosted by Namecheap. It's run on Cloudflare. It's hosted by Amazon. Type in Google DMCA, uh, you go to the abuse form, she can fill it in. And Amazon has been really, really well with me. They've taken down 90% uh, of the copies, the, the theft of it. I try to like, it's not a copy, it's a theft. Um, Namecheap has been really well with it with like banning their domain names. Uh, Cloudflare did really well. Stripe has not been that well, uh, unfortunately. So it couldn't be like hit, right? So if it's a copy based on the DMCA, um, you can pretty easily take it down and it's also not that long of a process. You don't have to go to legal actions. You don't have to hire a lawyer. You can just submit it yourself in pretty much five minutes. Okay. But in the end, there was no legal actual, I mean, let's say real legal actions and real, real. Okay. No. Okay. And, uh, you said. Uh, a lot of your evenings were uh, like uh, defending yourself and uh, spending spending time. It's kind of uh, bad for for the personal mental mental health. So it's I, I suppose that it has some negative impact. But uh, yeah, uh, how how you are dealing still with that? Uh, you said you you are making some kind of break. So how is going so far? I mean, uh, the, the, the does it still happens? And uh, do you care more care less? Some I think I, I hit the low on on Sunday two weeks ago where I wrote a post about the copy. And I think a lot of people were like um, telling me that I took it way too much, too personal. And I realized that I think I was focusing too much time in it. So I've accepted that it's happened. I'm not going to do too much about it anymore, except if it's just really simple. Um, and I'm just going to focus on my own product. So... At that moment, I decided I'm just going to take a social media break from Twitter, uh, Instagram, Reddit. I deleted all the apps from my phone. I spent one week completely offline trying to see, hey, how can I differentiate my product? How can I make it harder to copy it? I got some help from some friends that said, hey, maybe if you implement this, that, or that, it could be harder to do it. Uh, I sat down, like, what are the unique features that going to make it um, really well? So, yeah, I think... I took it way too personal, which is obvious if you worked so hard on it. Um, I took it too much to Twitter. So I just removed all the content I wrote about it. I just want to be positive about it again. But I've decided that I will not share anything I'm working on until it's finished. And it's going to be finished in a month or two. I'm making really good progress just to be before the copies that might copy it again, uh, just to not give a heads up. I just want to launch it, test it with my customers, and then go full working in the open again. like. Uh, what I implement, how I did it, what I learned an example, but maybe share a little less revenue numbers or stuff like that. Even though I think those tweets give the most engagement, I posted that I got X amount of revenue and I think that gave me that doubled my Twitter followers. So it's a really good way of marketing, but also really, again, with uh, another bad way because money brings copies. 
Yeah, and uh, uh, people are attracted by those numbers. I, I remember I shared that post on Twitter, and even my post, twi- even my tweet got really a lot of engagements based on the content that you provided. So it's kind of uh, pretty much uh, att- attractive. And uh, yeah, we, we have different uh, types of, uh, let's say, people in, in the audience. So yeah, those, thing, those things uh, uh, can happen. But uh, you, you said, uh, okay, besides these, uh, let's say, copycats and uh, uh, people that are actually saying you that it shouldn't be, that you shouldn't take it too personal, uh, were, were there any uh, trolls, internet trolls that uh, use this uh, um, situation? So, no, so not to copy the actual product uh, situation of being open, so not to actually copy the product or telling you that it's not a big deal, but uh, were there any trolls that, uh, I don't know, took it to another, completely another level with some, I don't know, that, that, that just came, came to my mind so <laughs> what i expected is that we're all indie hackers right so if someone po- copies your product or steals your product like it feels like i think everyone can realize that it hurts you um but the last post i made about it being open about it what i did about it it got a lot of trolls into the indie hacker posts saying i was crying about it being negative about it your tool is not worth it if it's so easy to copy then the, why how how are you even earning money with it even on twitter too like it went pretty negative and i think after that i realized that i should take a break just get away from it um just be more relaxed about it don't interact with too many people i think yeah the trolls um the trolls were like the 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 water that overflowed the buckets if that's a saying in english it's a saying in dutch um so yeah that maybe decide to it um i was just expecting I don't know. I was, I think as a solo developer, it's hard to get some support uh, because you're all doing it yourself. You don't have a co-founder, for example. So try to find some support uh, online. Um, yeah, I didn't get the support. So I was like, okay, I think I should stop tweeting about this. Uh, time to realize not to focus on it anymore. Just move on. Keep, take a break. So yeah. Yeah, you definitely should do what what works best uh, best for you. So we, in the end, it's the, all the, all that matters. So yeah, we are uh, slowly coming to to, to the end uh, to the end of the episode. So I have a few more questions or topics. So, but uh, in general, uh, what's your message to the people who are building their s- s- projects, side projects, or or whatever? Should they build in public? Uh, what should they? What should they share? Pros and cons, just uh, to to summarize it and uh, to have some kind of uh, main takeaways from this episode. Uh, I think everyone should one hundred percent work in the open because it has brought me so much more than it took away from me. I I think it's like maybe like a few key takeaways, like number one is you get in contact with so many awesome people I would have never expected I would be uh, talking to. Like I learned my conversion optimization from uh, this one institute, this one guy, and he DM me that he liked my tool. And I was like, holy shit, this guy is like really like a mentor to me. And he tweets me about it. You get to know so many awesome people. I get to be on this podcast because I work in the open. Um, so I think like net positive, everyone should, should work in the open it's also a really good way of you to keep on doing marketing for your product like i haven't tweeted for one half week and my sales have gone down drastically so i think by tweeting about what i do showing my um showing my learnings it's like a free way of marketing for my product too it gets like in front of other people their eyes they click on your profile um so yeah it's a good way of marketing it's a good way to meet people um just be careful that if your product is easily copyable, maybe be a little bit more careful with the revenue numbers you share. Maybe don't share like in a knowledge that only you should know because it's a competitive advantage to you. Uh, just but share the things you've learned, share the things you're working on. Um, I think indie hackers are, we're all proud to see that everyone is earning money with it because it gives you the feeling, like it gives you the security that also you can do it. Like I started doing this because I saw Peter Levels making a website and earning like a lot of money with it that made me start backpacking, nomad, uh, digital nomad. Um, I think if you work in the open, you share with things that can, um, it can change other people, their lives. 
And I think that's why the Indiaca community is so awesome. You don't have to go to MBA school, go to a business school, go to a marketing school. Like everything is shareable on the internet. And I think we live in such a good time right now to start your own product that way. So yeah, learn from others, give back to others. Just be careful about the most sensitive information. Yeah, I, I believe that that's the main takeaway of this episode. So one more thing, uh, kind of uh, off topic. So where are you at the moment? We have this six hours, I think, uh, time difference. Yep. Uh, what are you doing in your free time? So kind of uh, more, uh, let's say, personal <laughs> things uh, about you so that that uh, you, you were pretty much open, but about what you are building. Uh, so maybe just uh, just uh, some information who is Danny and what he's doing in free time. So, so I'm currently in Bali, Indonesia. Uh, it's very hot outside because it's starting to be rain season, so I think it's like 35 degrees now. I'm working in Tropical Nomads, which is in Changu, one of my favorite co-working spaces. As you can see, I have not been surfing too much lately because my face is pretty white for someone that lives in Bali. I've been focusing on my own products. Um, and because of COVID, like traveling is a little bit harder. They are really, really good here in doing the, the like the social distancing stuff you need to be checked everywhere you cannot just go into another village without having a reason there um but mostly in my free times so i like to surf i like to go on motorbike trips because the mountains are super awesome over here um i think like my main hobby is just working on my own products and launching it so that's what i'm doing a lot of times um, i like to go for food food is really cheap and really good over here so me and my girlfriend uh, are mostly going for a lot of dinners over here um yeah, that's basically what we do most of the time. A lot of working, six, do six days a week, but because I work remotely, I can set my own times. So maybe I start at seven o'clock in the morning and then at one I go serving. It's like a really nice flow. You don't force yourself to do things. It's like you just do whatever you want and it makes you really productive. Uh, what made you uh, to move to Bali? Uh, what, what was uh, uh, when, you, when you moved to Bali and... Uh, what was the main motivation? So I started um, backpacking in 2017, I think. After nine months seeing whole Asia and Oceania, I went Oceania. I don't know how to explain this. I went back to Holland for a year, and I think in that year I was like, I was starting a nine-to-five job, freelancing or whatever, starting a company, and I just realized like, why am I doing this? Like, I used to live such a good life, just being free in that way, living in a nice country. So I went back for two months again to Bali, came back to Holland again. And the last, the second last time I met my uh, girlfriend over here. And basically after that, I flew home and I realized, why would I live in Holland if I can just live in a sunny country where my money goes four times further? There is this awesome community of indie hackers where I learned so much from. Like I learned programming in six months, mostly because there's so many smart people here that help me. Like, how do you set up a database? How do you integrate Mongo, whatever? Like everyone is so hyped with each other and i don't think i got that in my hometown like good luck trying to find a group somewhere that's all people that are indie hackers SaaS builders whatever like with my friends like my friends for example they really like football it's hard for me to talk about it because i don't like football and i mostly do my businesses and here like everyone lives in the same kind of clouds it's all young people they all know what you're talking about my girlfriend is the manager of a co-working service so she knows exactly also everything about all this indie hacker stuff so yeah it's like a, it's a really nice place to live uh, and work and learn and yeah just enjoy life in general yeah and uh, i already uh, talked uh, with andrew kemfi from uh, also he he's uh, in bali and uh, i get the impression that uh, yeah you guys there are enjoying it uh, i mean especially enjoying the benefits of this uh, community yep. closed communities and uh, ex exchanging the ideas on the, on a daily basis and ch even challenging uh, each other it's pretty much uh, it's pretty pretty much a ni nice place to be okay so yeah we we talked mostly uh, about uh, building in publics but uh, when it comes uh, to your products we talked mostly about uh, headline so yeah now now is your chance to i don't know to plug your another links so where where people can find you what you are uh what you are building but not not <laughs> into too much details just <laughs> just a, a general uh, overview some pim some links that you want to share or some call to actions whatever so feel free to use it 
I think if you want to learn from my projects, learn from my process, when I start tweeting again, obviously, in a month, uh, go to my uh, Twitter. It's Denny Posma with a double A in the end because Denny Posma, the normal one, was taken. Um, in my bio, there's four products I'm working on. Uh, Lending Folio for landing page inspiration, headline for quick content generation, parity bar if you want to offer some price discounts for different products. I built it in 24 hours, but it's a talk for another time probably. And Inspire Frame, which is a tool to quickly make website mockups. But yeah, just follow me on Twitter. Um, that's where I link to all the products and tweet about it. I don't have an email list or whatever. So. Okay, and uh, I, I will put all, all of these links in the description. And uh, yeah, Parity Bar is as well a cool product. I even uh, suggesting suggesting it to to others, uh, but. Uh, uh, I didn't uh, want to put it in, in this episode because uh, it wasn't kind of part of the, the whole uh, uh, building in, pro in uh, public uh, pros and cons uh, mood. So, yeah, definitely it's a, it's a thing uh, uh, worth uh, check checking out. But, yeah, we can maybe talk about that in, a, in some other episodes as, as well. So, yeah, uh, thanks again for being my guest. It was uh, really a pleasure to have you, to have you here and uh, to listen uh, to, to your, um, uh, to, to your uh, side, point, uh, side of story or however uh, to call, call it. Uh, the main takeaways, uh, as, as, we, as we were saying, uh, if you are building a product that is easily to copy, then probably consider uh, not being too much open about it. Don't uh, reveal too much uh, uh, knowledge about what made your decisions uh, uh, go into this or that direction. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that, that that was that was the main takeaway. Thanks again, Danny, uh, for being my guest. Thank you for having me, uh, Bruno. It was really cool.